you ask me which place did we go, right? And I just see your name at least. What was the name? Kalpona. Kalpona. This Kalpona beach is a good 40 kilometers from the place we are staying at. We are staying close to Majolda. You probably thought that I already know this beach and there is something special about it. Something in you can. Before we were to hit the beach, it somehow got disclosed that I'm coming here for the first time. I didn't really know the place I was leading you to. And then uh, one of us, probably Kunal, asked the post for the purpose then. There are uh, beaches every two miles in Goa. Why should I uh, bring you all the way to this place from Majoda when we had so many other beaches in between options like Bilwa, Madur and many others. So many names. And I said I'll tell you. And now is the time to tell you. Right? We are sitting at uh, that beach. Kalpona. Kalpona beach. And uh, it's raining. It's around 9 in the night. It's utterly dark. Just the beautiful music of the waves hitting the shore. I won't say anything. Caressing the shore. And uh, yeah. I want to talk to you about Ithaka. Ithaka. When it comes to journeys, Ithaka is one poem that instantly comes to me. I used to teach Ithaka to my students around 17, 18 years back. And, uh, today, when you ask me why, did I bring you to this place? If Haka just instantly came to my mind, right? So what's it Haka? If Haka is both a geographical location and a mythological place. It's an island near Greece. At the same time, in mythology, it has been considered since antiquity to be the home of Odysseus. Right? So, Homer's Odyssey is in a way, uh, some of you already read it, you know, centered around Odysseus's delayed return to Ithaca. In the last century, in the early part of the last century, Constantine Tawafi wrote a beautiful poem on the myth of Ithaca. What is Ithaca? Ithaca is an island, it's, it's, it's the home of Odysseus. And Odysseus must return. But if there are dangers and there are obstacles and there is Delay. So there is a thaka that one looks forward to, I want to reach there, that's my destination. Hmm? And the lure of that destination, in the legend of that destination, comes to life beautifully with a great message in this poem. Hmm? And I'll read it to you.
transmission is by Edmund Keeley. As you set out for Ithaca, hope your road is a long one. Right? Keep uh, the context of our journey this afternoon alive in your mind. Hmm? So, as you set out for Ithaca, hope your road is a long one. Full of adventure, full of discovery, Lestrigonians, Silops, angry Poseidon, don't be afraid of them. These are the monsters, these are the these are the obstacles that uh, you are likely to meet along the way or you assume you would meet. You will never find things like that on your way. The poet says they don't really exist. From where do they really come from? As long as you keep your thoughts raised high. Right? As long as a rare excitement steers your spirit and your body. You will never find things like that on your way as long as you keep your thoughts raised high, as long as a rare excitement steers your spirit and your body. Gastrogonians, Silops, Wild Poseidon, you won't encounter them unless you bring them along inside your soul. You won't encounter them unless you bring them along inside your soul, unless your soul sets them up in front of you. Hmm? Read the soul as the mind. Unless you bring them along in your soul, unless your soul sets them up, projects them in front of you. Hope your road is a long one. Right? The poet isn't uh, wishing you an early arrival. Hope your road is a long one. May there be many summer mornings when, with that, with what pleasure, what joy, you enter harbors you are seeing for the first time. May there be many summer mornings when, with what pleasure, what joy, you enter harbors you are seeing for the first time. May you stop at Phoenician trading stations to buy fine things. There's no need to rush. We have fine things along the way. Right? Stop there. Buy those things. Hmm? Mother of pearl and coral, amber and ebony, sensual perfume of every kind, as many sensual perfumes as you can. Right? Hmm? And may you visit many Egyptian cities. To learn and go on learning from their scholars. Keep Ithaka always in your mind. Keep the destination always in your mind. Arriving there is what you are destined for. But don't hurry the journey at all. Better if it lasts for years. So you are old by the time you reach the island better if it lasts for years, so you are old by the time you reach the fabled island. Wealthy with all you have gained on the way. Wealthy not on reaching the island, wealthy not because you have reached, wealthy with all that you have gained on the way. On the way. Not expecting Ithaka to make you rich. Not expecting Ithaka to make you rich. Ithaka gave you the marvelous journey. Hmm. This beach gave you the marvelous, marvelous journey. Ithaka gave you the marvelous journey. Without her, you wouldn't have set out. Without her, you wouldn't have set out. She has nothing left to give you now. The journey was all she wanted to bestow upon you. And if you find her poor, Ithaka won't have fooled you. Wise as you will have become, so full of experience, you have understood by then, you have understood by then what these Ithakas mean. 
you have understood by then what these Ithakas mean. And if you find her poor, Ithaka won't have fooled you, wise as you have become, so full of experience, you have understood by then what these Ithakas mean. Right? But the ultimate is not really a point to be reached. You see the resonance of Advait Vedantya is really no place to reach. Okay. The riches that you are expecting on the destination do not lie at all with the destination. They actually lie on the great journey that wouldn't have been possible but for the destination. So the value of the destination actually lies in the journey. And that's why you must respect that destination. Not for what that destination has, but for the journey that the destination gives you. Do you see what then the true self is? Do you see what Brahm and Atma are? They, they are poor in one sense, in Kabaki's sense. Poor in the sense they don't have anything to give. Because they really don't exist in the worldly sense of the word existence. They don't even exist. But if you target the self, then you will have a beautiful life. You target the self in a beautiful life. Not that you will get anything. You will have a great journey. Did you enjoy the journey this afternoon, this evening? I had no idea of it. What sufficed for me was that this is an unknown thing and that's the people. Target loses much of its value, its sheen, its attractiveness. The moment it is male, popular, normal, vulgar. The word vulgar means common, normal. If we go into the etymology of the word vulgar, it means common. Since the target is known in advance, there is really no fun in the journey. I brought you here because I really didn't know much about this field. In fact, not much is known about this field. It's not a field frequented by tourists. There is only shack he found over here and uh, good for you. We didn't even expect to find this much. We left the more renowned and lucrative features behind. To pursue something so unknown. That's a Tata that's also been my life, leaving the known behind to pursue something that's just not known. Even available to the known. Don't want to reach anywhere, just want to have a good time. Good time? Mm -hmm. What else do we have? Life is time. If you can have a good time, you have had a good life. Yeah. What else do you want? Yeah. Let's just keep moving towards any other. May you never reach. Kawafi says, May you reach not before you are old. I say, may you never reach at all. May you just keep moving. Is that a bad deal? Yeah. In light of today's experience, is that a bad deal? Not, 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 not at all.
It is a mischievous pleasure in leaving the known behind. In some way, you know, the mind is forbidden to leave the known behind. And to young people like you, and I guess me, <laughs> the forbidden things hold a, cer a certain greater appeal, don't they? Similarly, the, the highest and the most forbidden pleasure that the mind can have is called Atma. We think you know, pleasures like, uh, like so many things, you know, consumption, this and that, uh, insects, these are forbidden behind a, beyond a point. Fact is, the one thing that is absolutely forbidden to the mind is the truth, Atma. And that's why there is that, that great pleasure in seeking you know, the truth. Truth is the most forbidden of all territories. You are just not allowed to go there. In the domain of the false, you can venture out as far as you want. Truth, out of bounds. Why should I accept anything as out of bounds? Huh? So, if you want to pursue the truth, you'll have to pursue the unknowable. You'll have to run the risk of moving in the dark without a compass. At times you will feel like a fool to yourself. Just keep pressing on. By the way, Ithaka now is actually a populated island. Thousands of people live here. So we are not really referring to Ithaka, the geography. We are referring to Ithaka, the spirit it represents in mythology. I'll, I'll reread the parts that speak the most to me. Hmm? As you set out for Ithaka, hope your road is a long one. Come on, what kind of wish or blessing is that? As you set out for Ithaka, hope your road, hope your road is a long, long, long one. one. Hmm? Full of adventure, full of discovery. May you never be condemned to take the beaten path. May you always find yourself on a road you know nothing of. Huh? And don't be afraid of monsters or obstacles. You will never find things like that on the way. But they come to you when you are not on your way. The ones who are standing still, stagnate, stagnating, afraid to set out, they are the ones who think of all the troubles and dangers and, and monsters and risks that might come to them in the journey. You never find things like that on your way as long as you keep your thoughts raised high. What does it mean to keep your thoughts raised high? Keep your thoughts on the high. Ithaka is the high. And therefore the poet says elsewhere, may you keep thinking of Ithaka. May Ithaka stay in your thoughts. You never find things like that on your way as long as you keep your thoughts raised high. There is a lesson here, a very important one. If you find yourself 
troubled or frightened, you should know it is because your thoughts have been deviating from the center. So if you want to keep aside your fear, just start thinking of the real thing. Move to the right center and everything associated with the wrong center will evaporate. Fear belongs to the wrong center. Being fearful is a clear indication that you are sitting at the wrong center. So don't fight fear, just move your center. How do you move your center? By thinking of the right things. Think of it, Hathi. Think of your real life. Think of your dignity. Think of your tremendous beauty. Think of the utter glory of it, Hathi. Then you see your Right? You never find things like that on your way as long as you keep your thoughts raised high. If you fall, it would be because your thoughts have fallen before you. So don't let your thoughts fall. And if your thoughts have fallen, you will not take long to fall. You will just follow the fall of your thoughts. As long as a rare excitement steers your spirit and your body. Rare excitement. Usually we are excited about things known in advance. Our excitement is just a recycled one. Is it not? You have known something to be exciting and you just want to repeat that pleasure, that excitement, that experience. What is the point for me? A rare excitement stirring your spirit, your thoughts, your body. You do not know what the whole thing is about and still it lifts you up. Fills you up with life, with energy, with vigor. You suddenly find a spunk in your soul. Hmm? The mind becomes zesty and peppy, ready to go. Towards what? I do not know. <laughs> but ready to go. Why are you so happy? What are you so excited about? What's it about? Hmm? I don't know. A rare excitement fills up your spirit, your thoughts, your body. Hmm? Dastigonians, Silaps, Posidon, you won't encounter them unless you bring them along inside your soul. There are really no troubles along the way. And if you're encountering troubles, you must know. These are the troubles of your own mind. Now don't attribute your troubles to the destination or the journey. Neither is the destination intent on offering you trouble nor is the journey really troublesome. It says that your mind still has value for something besides that destination. Your mind still finds importance in something other than that destination. And therefore the mind raises specters. The mind projects stuff. Are you getting Unless you bring them inside your soul, unless your soul sets them up in front of you. Classic case of the mind projecting your world as we so many talk of in a practice. Hmm? The world is your own projection. As you are, so is your world. Unless your soul sets these things up in front of you. Whenever you are frightened, whenever there is trouble, you must know the trouble is not coming from the the, the right thing. The right thing can never be a source of trouble. The troubles are coming from your inner resistance to the right thing. Hope your road is a long one. May there be many summer mornings when with what pleasure, what joy you enter harbors you are seeing for the first time. May there be many, many firsts in your life, in your journey. That's the point in living, no? 
Right? Yeah. We have one line. So we want it to be full of firsts. Don't be too. Or do you want to live a day exactly as the last one was? You don't. And the journey offers you first. May you stop at Phoenician trading stations to buy five things. Don't rush. Don't rush. They are fine things and fine pleasures along the way, but they are available only to those who take the right road. And what's the definition of the right road? That leads to the right destination. There is no other right road. So if along your road you do not find these fine pleasures, it is because the road itself was not the right road. Is not the right road. If the road of your journey is offering you no fine pleasure, then the probable reason is that Give her these vegetables, no? These, ah, these yeah. vegetables. Hello? Would you want some tea? <laughs> she wants to go. She, she might have. Hmm. Give us this with an alert. Keep Ithaka always in your mind. Keep Ithaka always in your mind so that other stuff doesn't possess or dominate your mind. Don't keep Ithaka in the mind and you will find that the mind has been colonized by nonsense. That's why Ithaka, the unknown, rather the unknowable, must still be remembered. That's the thing that everything worth remembering. Do not remember the worthy one and you will find yourself in the clutches of something very very unworthy. unworthy. Hmm? Keep the thought always in your mind. Arriving there is what you are destined for but don't hurry the journey at all. Better if it lasts for years. So you are old by the time you reach the island. Wealthy with all you have gained on the way. Not expecting Ithaka to make you rich. You expect Ithaka to make you rich only if you are still poor. But if the journey has been right, the journey won't leave you poor. So why would you still harbor expectations from Ithaka? Hmm? Ithaka gave you the marvelous journey. Ithaka gave you the marvelous journey. Without her, you wouldn't have set out. 
she has nothing left to give you now. Nothing left to give you now. And if you find her poor, Ithaka won't have fooled you. Wise as you will have become so full of experience, you will have understood by then what these Ithakas mean. Yes. Tell me what you mind me. तो भी आप नहीं मिलेगा, कर नहीं मिलेगा। तो दो हज़ार साल के बाद मैं कभी शाब्दिक से जैसे राम बुलावा कुंजी आदि आप कभी करें। जो सुख शाब्दिक समझे सो बैकुल नहीं है, जब बैकुल तो कुछ नहीं है। ये तो इस you're targeting back in then you meet the sadhu along the way and if you have really met the sadhu along the way what does the sadhu represent? great company uplifting company sadhu is not to be taken as a particular type of personality sadhu simply represents the one to be with And if you really have been with the sadhu, truly, deeply, then why would you be left with any demand or urge for Bakunt anymore? All that Bakunt could have potentially given you has already been gifted to you by the sadhu's company. Now the sadhu's company is for real and Bakunt is just a concept. Why would you give up the real for something conceptual? Similarly, there is this uh, slow tone that that is very close to me that I basically tell this that is Charaveti Charaveti. Ah. Iki Iki it's very very important that we do not take the spiritual journey as one different thing. The spiritual journey is unending or open-ended, whichever way you want to do it. It does not have a goal. Or you could say the goal is infinite and unreachable. And it's great for us that it stays unreachable. Because everything that is within our reach is really not different from the one who would reach it. So if the spiritual destination becomes something within your reach, then it loses all its value. For it to maintain its value, it's important that it remains unreachable, untouchable, unthinkable. So just keep moving. There's a, there's a question that, that comes from this very notion of keep moving. We find a lot of people saying wanderlust, keep wandering, keep rolling under the skies. And then there is a movement of the self also, that is you are moving inside also. So, mm -hmm. uh, how do we, uh, for me as a, as a person who is wanting to come to the unknowable, how do I not fall in the trap that this is not some wonderless stuff? This is not me giving it the... Watch whether you are repeating your experiences. 
that which we call as renderless is not really aimless or in the domain of the unknown. You don't just randomly render away. Inquire into the process of rendering. Are you really going to unknown places? Are you really rendering away to places unknown? So even if you are bestowing a lot of glory on your tendency by calling it renderless, it is not really rendering in the in the right sense of the word. You are not rendering. Your movement is still a planned one. Your movement is still a destined one. Your movement is a pre-plotted and predetermined one. Right? It takes a lot of spiritual courage to really bend. This poem was about that. And ironically, when you are really wandering, you have Ithaka in mind. The road to Ithaka, therefore, is like the sky. It's not your typical linear road along the ground that you find in the usual maps. When the destination is Ithaka, the road is very very wide. Just as Ithaka is something marvelous and novel, similarly the road to Ithaka is extremely novel. Do not imagine it to be the usual kind of When people say they want to travel, which are the places to which they travel? The top 10 places written on the They are not rendering, they are picking the boxes. Been to this place, been to this place, been to this place. And what are these places? Places that are known in advance to the tourist destination. Or you could probably go to a lesser known place which merely means a lesser known tourist destination. It still is a tourist destination, it will be the lesser known. And you go just fills up with excitement. I'm going to ask Others they all go to and things in view. And look at me, I've come to a small town in the I'm real then. I'm a million You still have gone to a small town in the Keep it deep that you will know, the next plan of a trip to a small town in Nigeria. It's still somehow within the zone of the moon. Do not win. You are sure of the place. You are sure of the place and you have a definite purpose in reaching that place. You are operating within the domain of security. You know what you are going to and why you are going to it. Haka is beyond the knowledge and security of the mind. That is why I guess the mind also turns it foolish at times. Foolish at times and terrifying. Terrifying. Mm -hmm. If you are a sucker for security, the data is not. The data is for those. Are we done?
there are times, uh, there are times, as you said, as the poet also says that, let the journey be a long one and may you never reach. But the mind is conditioned and it's always looking forward to a destination. And a destination is what, like a, a destination which is not very far. So that the motivation is there, so that I am work the I am working for the destination. Like I am moving towards it, and that is what is motivating me to keep going forward. And uh, so that is one that obviously, if the journey is long, I mean, in context of our drive here today. I was the I was behind the wheel and I was the one riding the jeep. So I honestly didn't want to reach, and precisely that's why I was I wasn't even putting the second gear. So that is one journey. That is one kind of journey. But it's not as pleasurable and as beautiful as it was. As it was today, the journey is always not like that. Rather, most of the times it is quite the opposite, and uh, one just wants to reach quickly and get over, like, get it over with. Uh, so, and uh, so I want to ask you that during that journey, which I quickly want to finish it off. And I just want to reach and get it done. With. So, but at the same time, as you said, the nature of every man is joy, and like everyone else, I am also looking for joy and and pleasure. So, what keeps me going? I mean, obviously, I see you cannot know the destination, right? But that does not mean you cannot have micro targets. You cannot have an ultimate or a final target, but you must have micro targets in between. What are these micro targets? Overcoming the resistances you meet along the way. Most of these troubles or resistances will be internal. Even if they appear external, they will be projections of something within. Right? So you do have a target. It's not that you are moving about in a vacuum. There are tangible and material things to be done, right? Tangible milestones to be touched and crossed. Hmm? And very tangible goalposts. You need to run and dribble towards them. But they are not the ultimate thing. Those struggles, those resistances, those things to be done, they come to you because you are not yet perfect. Since you are not yet perfect, so there is a lack of sureness within you with respect to the destination it had or took. That same lack of sureness within you presents itself as the experience of trouble or resistance or boredom or, or something else. And then what do you do? You fight it, you overcome it. Where is pleasure in that? Isn't there pleasure in overcoming an adversary? And there is great pleasure in overcoming an adversary when the adversary carries your name and face. Today the pleasure was straight and direct and very observable. What was the pleasure about? The road was beautiful, the journey was scenic, the air was fresh, the beach is serene. So these were the pleasures, right? And you had great company to boot. 
there would be times when these pleasures would not be available to you in the affirmative sense in the sense you will not be able to claim that certain great things have happened to you today in the journey when great things happen to you the pleasure lies in simply experiencing the greatness as you did today right when so called bad things happen to you then the pleasure lies in overcoming and sustaining the badness i have survived all the bad things that happened to me today why is that not a pleasure today the pleasure was i experienced all the good things that happened to me another day the pleasure would be i overcame or at least survived all the wild things that tried to happen to me what a great pleasure is that is it not sometimes the pleasure lies in scoring a goal another minute the pleasure lies in defending one defending your goal post or averting a possible goal and both these aspects part of every game you can't have just one kind of pleasure which lies in scoring, scoring a goal the great saves also huh they are great saves they are great saves also so so you can have the the pleasure of saving an almost certain goal and don't you see how goalkeepers react if they have saved if they have made a great save how do they react with all you glory. see the jubilation in their body you see the the thing in their eyes ha huh? isn't that a pleasure same as scoring a goal same as scoring a goal much the same hmm? so on the days when uh, when 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 things are not as nice and the day is not as bright huh? then you have to uh, draw pleasure from just surviving that day right we were about to lose the day but we survived to fight the next day that's the pleasure huh? great players have a very balanced game when they attack they are unstoppable when they defend they are impenetrable that's how you should be unstoppable when you are thrusting ahead and impenetrable when you are blocking and you need both because there is much that you need to defend against there is much that you need to just totally block we you know that right so many things arise within us we just need to stubbornly block them. and there is a great pleasure in blocking the thing that you know to be wrong just block it and enjoy the pleasure hmm? it will it will beckon it will tempt and then it will threaten and you remain unflattered isn't that a pleasure <laughs> there is a difference between the game of a federer and a djokovic once game is founded on attack and the other is like a wall you cannot reach both are great in their own right Yeah, please. <laughs> no, it's not for us. 
to look in the earth. <laughs> yeah, but the, why did you do anything? Suddenly he's asking, what am I doing here? <laughs> Yes, yes. That's what happens after a tiny meal. आप वो डिफेंड करना चाह रहे हो एक चीज में जो उस चीज में है ही नहीं आप उस पीस को सिक्योर करना चाह रहे हो जो एग्जिस्ट ही नहीं करती जो लाइफलेस है जो डेड है what is the way the key to maintain equanimity because with speed and time things change situations change and it is very surprising sometimes it becomes absurd and funny also that situations with same person situations in the same place can be can touch both the ends so one when one is at one end one feels what that end expects you to feel and similarly for the other end but one when when has gone through both the ends n number of times one feels uh, i mean one feels one laughs at one cell uh, how weak you are so one really craves for uh, something that remains stable when you are at one end that end feels real but the other end also comes and then you are like shit this was not as real i mean this was not at all real this is real so this uh, and is it even theoretically your uh, So look, is it even possible that when you are actually at one extreme, you remain untouched, or is it just a thing that they say? This is practically impossible. Obviously, if you look at your own statement, you will see that you are talking of two. You are saying that you want to remain untouched even when you are at an extreme. So you surely are not talking about one entity, right? You are talking about an entity that's at an extreme, and you are talking about an entity that is not at an extreme, and that's what is to be understood. There is a part of you that will always be vulnerable to situations, right? It's, it's, it's a part of your humanness. 
you will be vulnerable it's what makes you a person at the same time there has to be something extremely in alienable from you something that no situation can kind of make you abandon Look at life. We have examples. You know, when the worst or the best of situations and their constants and the things that situations do not change, at least not easily. So extend that, extrapolate that. When you see that it is possible to have something in life. That is just not in the domain of situations. Obviously, the domain of situations is there. Is there any kind of topic? Life is all about change, right? Is it not? No two movements are the same. And your body, your mind, your senses, they all experience the changes. So there is certainly a part of you that will always remain dependent on situations. Irrespective of how enlightened you feel yourself to be. Right? Put your hand on fire, and you'll have to smell burning flesh. Situations matter, don't they? Irrespective of whether you are unsure, unsure, doesn't matter. Situations will have an effect on you. So if you are desiring to be completely unavailable to happenings it's not happening <laughs> we all have a certain porosity things seep in things touch us and it's beautiful in a sense you won't be human if something within you doesn't respond to the sunset to the sea to the beach to this cat to that dog they are situations right all of these that we just named are situations and you'd be corpse like if the cat doesn't stir up something within you if you remain totally vacuous to the sight of sunset right? the waves must evoke a certain response a certain poetry from within you hmm? but that must be able to well up your eyes a good joke must be able to evoke laughter from you and these are all situations are they not hmm? you should be able to appreciate good irony good humor satire as well as absurdity and stupidity right they all exist around us and we should be able to to have a way to response very life fully to them hmm? a lively response a living response and at the same time that non negotiable thing must stay with them in fact these two 
necessarily go together if one does not exist neither does the other only when you are able to have an untouchable core do you afford great freedom on the periphery if the core is not unshakable then you cannot afford freedom in life and by that i mean periphery of life which is these daily movements relationships conversations dealings transactions this is the periphery of life if you want to have freedom in all this then you should have something utterly immovable within these two go together i give the example of the ceiling fan for the ceiling fan to have freedom in its rotation its axis the central axis must be totally immovable but even the ceiling fan is a very limited example it's just a vague pointer because all the freedom that it has is in just two dimensions in one particular plane and to a certain distance beyond that it has no freedom but it helps as a pointer and we do not pay apprehensive that spirituality entails a deadening of the mind of the spirit or life the spiritual man is very alive very lively he is not unresponsive he is greatly and accurately responsive you get it and if you find him moved by situations it is because he can afford the movement without being frightened of being dislocated from his center most of us cannot afford smooth movement resistance less movement in our lives which means we cannot experience life fully because we are afraid that the movement would go all the way up to the core and dislocate the core the core has to be so firmly the third so unshakable that you are able to confidently afford total movement Hmm? barrierless movement limitless movement on the periphery you should not be afraid you should know that you are so greatly anchored to the shore by an invisible rope that you can go miles thousands of miles deep into the sea and yet would never be lost because your relationship your connection with the shore can never be broken it cannot be tethered why because the rope is invisible a visible rope can be cut an invisible one can't be alvin and then you can confidently and with abandon enjoy the seas because now you know that the waves won't swallow you that the sea is incapable of drowning you that come what may you'll be home when you need to be in a sense you're always home and that's how the wise man lives in one dimension he is always home in the other dimension he is never home because he does not need to be home why because he is already home since he is always home so he does not need to be home hence he can afford complete and regardless and reckless movement and wandering he would never need to temper his movements he would never need to exercise caution i am talking of an extreme but just to give you a vague picture 
he would never need to exercise caution. Why? Because he is truly always home. He has not stepped out at all. So how can he be lost? And because he is truly home, so he can step out and just roll in the ocean. And just play anywhere in the world. The world is his play field. He can be anywhere. And still he is home. That is the state of the wise one. Do not judge him by his location in life, his situation, his responses, his engagements or involvements. He is always home. It doesn't matter what you perceive him as doing, how you perceive him as located. You do not know his real location. His real location is beyond your perception. I am talking of the wise man so that even conceptually you feel inspired. At least conceptually that is. Such a possibility not only merely exists, this possibility needs to be materialized if life is to be worth living. Others should get the impression that you have totally forgotten home. And then all of a sudden, they find that you are home. You don't need to keep professing to others, wearing a banner on your head, I am devoted to home or I am home. Huh? There are so many of us who are so afraid of being homeless. Right? That they kind of carry a banner sticker on their forehead. I am devoted to home. This excessive display of wisdom or devotion or spirituality simply signifies a lack of confidence in your devotion. Were you really devoted, you won't need to act so ornate. In fact, the more centered you are, the more loose you may appear at times. Because you can afford that looseness. Only you can afford that looseness, others can't. Getting? Hence, the real wise man can come across as highly deceptive to the world. He does nothing that the world expects him to. When the world is worshipping in its temples, he might just be found rolling in the sand on the beach. And it's the time to worship. <coughs> He's not worshipping. Explain the sand. I am not saying that you must skip the temple or something, please. You appreciate where the example is coming from, right? Because the temple is not there in your heart, so you can afford to roll in the sand. Because now you cannot forget, so you can pretend to forget. Because now you cannot sleep, so you can pretend to sleep. Because now you cannot get hurt, so you can act as if you were deeply hurt or you can allow yourself to be hurt. You see, now you don't need to defend yourself. You have a great inner armor, so you can allow yourself to be hurt. And the bullet 
or the arrow would penetrate you because you are human but only till a point remember it's not that you are impenetrable when you invite her her would affect you the bullet would penetrate but only till a point beyond that something would remain pristine untouched unavailable to anything worldly including bullets or taunts or allegations or situations so it's complex it's beyond the dull game of images on one hand you have to be very very human on the other hand something of the beyond must be at your center once i had said to be human is to have the sky in the heart and the earth in the body these two together this thing was about the wise man wherein you said he he lives unruffled from inside so if you talk about the other other part for example when, when i was listening to all this i became very inspired and you know it just filled me up so on, on that side if i look was i see i am very i keep myself very, under a lot of caution how to move along and how to talk around and, and do many other things so how do so the inspiration part is i got inspired by all this so how do i move ahead with this if i would want to the caution that you are keeping is well advised and all fine i was talking about the perfect state huh until you reach that state caution is advisable i'm saying when you are firmly tethered then you can afford to run a mock but only when you are firmly tethered if you are not firmly tethered and still you give yourself the privilege to run a mock what would happen you will be lost so it's all right to exercise caution and if you exercise caution with due diligence and discipline soon you will find that the need to exercise caution keeps diminishing that's the thing with discipline and caution and practice the more disciplined you remain and the more is the duration for which you practice discipline the less is the effort needed to remain disciplined discipline becomes a way of life a way of life now you don't have to remain disciplined now you are disciplined therefore you can afford to run a run a mock and appear in discipline because now even if you appear in discipline that won't take anything away from your discipline now discipline is in alienable from you even if you want to be in discipline you cannot be it's no more a choice it's flowing in your blood now uh, 
have uh, I've seen this totally uh, in a very personal drama that uh, small thing like losing my mobile or uh, forgetting an important task has slowly and slowly diminished because as if the mind in itself knows uh, that even I have to get a few things done. Even when I slept very late, I was up just before time to get that thing done and be on my way. That is something that I have observed that the system in itself is operating on that. On and when the system gets trained that way, then discipline is no more a tax or a chore oh, or a demand upon you. Right? Now discipline is Sahaj. Hmm? Naturally. It, it, it has a beauty to it. It has a beauty and a smoothness to it and an authenticity to it. Now discipline is not something you are practicing. Now discipline is how you are living. And therefore this this true discipline is not very obvious or apparent. It's not a thing to show off. It's not a thing that others can easily read. Till that time you reach that place, one feels as if something choked and you want to just throw it up, just push it up and just throw it up. Till that you know, it, it feels like something is choked and you just want to spark and just put it off. You have to keep patient. And yes, there has to be very eager love for the real life. On the other hand, you should not allow that eagerness to rush you into indiscretion. Hmm? That eagerness has to be tempered with patience. In fact, unbridled eagerness is in a way a sign of inauthenticity. Patience is a price that you pay. If you are being impatient, it merely means you are not valuing the thing enough to pay the price. And if you don't value the thing enough, why must you get the thing? Mm-hmm.